Welcome to Math TV with Professor V. In this video, we're going to look at examples of curve sketching for the calculus student involving rational functions, rational functions that have oblique asymptotes, and rational functions that have a hole in the graph. So exciting. This is not an introductory video, so if you haven't watched my first video explaining the basics on curve sketching, I'll link it here for you to watch before you continue. These examples are more advanced. And then I also have another video that looks at more complicated examples of curve sketching with logarithmic functions, exponential functions, trigonometric functions. So I'll link that now as well if you want just more examples. More examples is always a good idea. All right, so just as a recap, here's the basic steps for curve sketching that most textbooks and guidelines um, instructors will want you to follow, okay? So first one, um, state the domain of your function. This is super important also that after you state it, you keep it in the forefront of your mind, okay? You'll see why I'll, I'll remind you throughout the problem. Step two, you wanna find the X and Y intercepts. Step three, test for symmetry. Sometimes I skip it. You know, you can kind of take a look and do it if it helps you. If not, whatever. Step four, find the vertical and horizontal asymptotes. Now, for my students, I'm fine if you use your pre-calc techniques to find the vertical asymptote. However, for a horizontal asymptote, yes, 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 you must consider the limit as x goes to positive and negative infinity of your function, okay? And make sure you consider both the limit to positive infinity and negative infinity because we know they're not always the same, right? Think of our good friend tan inverse of x. It has two horizontal asymptotes on its graph. So just because you find one of them does not mean it's one and done. Um, next step, you're going to take the derivative and then find your critical values then list intervals of increase and decrease and any local extrema. Step seven, F double prime of X, second derivative, and then list your intervals of concavity where it's concave up, concave down, and any inflection points. And then lastly, put it all together and graph. Um, make sure on your graph, you include everything that you found in the previous steps. So all your intercepts, all your asymptotes, the local extrema, inflection points, it all better be on there. You don't need to go and find additional points to put on your graph. Of course, you can, especially if you don't feel comfortable drawing it. But usually at that point, you found enough info, you should be able to put together a very excellent graph of the function. All right. So let's dive into it. I'm going to do three examples for you guys. Just basic rational function first, and then we'll do... Maybe one with the hole and then the oblique last. Okay. So graph the following functions according to the guidelines above. First example I have for you is f of x equals x over x squared minus 4. Okay. Good. So we want to state the domain. At this point, you're in calc. You could probably tell just by looking, but I'll factor the denominator Anyway, so we have x over x plus 2 times x minus 2. So the domain is going to be all x's such that x does not equal plus or minus 2. Good. Now let's go ahead and find any intercepts. So x-intercept comes from setting the function equal to 0. So if I set the function equal to 0, that's equivalent to just setting the numerator equal to 0. So I get 0, 0 as the x-intercept. And also, f of 0, my y-intercept, is the same. So the x and y-intercept is just 0, 0. Only one intercept on this whole graph. All right, good. Now let's look at the asymptotes. So as I said... I'm fine if you use pre-calc methods for the vertical asymptotes. Meaning, once your function is completely simplified in lowest terms, which this one is, right? I can't cancel out any common factors. Then you can find the equations of the vertical asymptotes by setting each of the factors in the denominator equal to zero. So I'm going to have two vertical asymptotes this time. One at x equals two, 
1 at x equals negative 2. Now, just make sure, if you have an instructor who's maybe a little bit pickier, that you do actually confirm these are vertical asymptotes by taking a limit. How would you do that? Well, you would take the limit as x approaches, you would do positive 2 from one side of the function, x over x squared minus 4. And then remember, you have to check. Now, the denominator is going to 0, but through positive values, since we're approaching 2 from the right. And the numerator is positive, which means this limit is positive infinity. And that indicates that, yes, our graph has a vertical asymptote there since it's approaching positive infinity as x approaches 2 from the right. Then you would continue. Okay, what's the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of x over x squared minus 4? Well, if we're approaching 2 from the left, this time we're going to 0, but through negative values since we're coming from, like, I think 1.9, 1.99, so if I square it, that's going to be smaller than 4. And then the numerator is positive again. So this limit's going to be negative infinity. You see how this works? And then there's two more cases because we also have a vertical asymptote at negative 2. So then you would need to go ahead and then think about what those limits would be. I'll fill them in for you. So we have the limit. x goes to negative 2 from the right of x over x squared minus 4. So from the right of negative 2, just be careful. That's like negative 1.9, negative 1.99, right? Just a little bit bigger. So the denominator is going to be going to 0 through negative values. The numerator is negative. So this limit is positive infinity. And then one more limit as we go to negative 2 from the left. And I'll let you think about that one, but no surprise, it's negative infinity, okay? I'm not going to do this work for all of the examples, just this one. I don't really need you to do this if you're in my class. You can just say x equals 2, x equals negative 2, okay? Now, for the horizontal asymptote, yes, 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 we must take a limit. And you want to consider the limit as the function approaches, as x approaches positive infinity and negative infinity. So horizontal asymptote time. Here we go. So we're going to look at the limit. I just start off usually as x goes to positive infinity, and then I'll think about the negative case in a minute. Of x over x squared minus 4. Okay, I know you just learned L'Hopital's rule most likely and you're probably excited to use it, but really I prefer sticking with the basic techniques that you learned in the beginning of the semester. So just divide by the highest power of x in the denominator, which is x squared. Okay, and then we've got the limit as x goes to infinity. Um, x over x squared is going to be 1 over x. And then in the denominator, I'm going to have 1 minus 4 over x squared. Yeah? Good, good, good. So now as x goes to infinity, 1 over x is going to approach 0. In the denominator, that 1 is a constant. And then negative 4 over x squared, that's going to 0 also. So I just have 0 over 1, which is 0. Okay. Um, would things have changed if x was going to negative infinity instead? No, right? This would still go to 0. This would still go to 0. So when that happens, then all I do is I just switch this little guy around and I say, oh, plus or minus. Same thing. Okay. So we've got one horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. Now, I know you have pre-calculus techniques that tell you if you have a function... And the degree of the denominator is higher than the degree of the numerator, automatically you can say, oh, the horizontal asymptote is at y equals 0. Because notice, this denominator is degree 2, and the numerator is degree 1. All right? But you're in calculus now, so you can't just spit facts like that. You have to justify it with a limit. Agreed? 
Very good. So those are our asymptotes. We've got vertical ones at x equals plus or minus 2, and then horizontal at y equals 0. Good. Next up, let's take a derivative. Okay, f prime of x. So I'll remind you, f of x equals x over x squared minus 4. And let's go ahead, use our quotient rule so we can find f prime of x. So f prime of x is going to be, do you sing it? Low d high, so denominator times derivative of numerator minus high d low over low low. Square the bottom, away you go. All right, let's see what we have here. This is x squared minus 4 minus 2x squared over x squared minus 4 squared. And then I can write this as negative x squared minus 4, if I combine like terms in the numerator, over x squared minus 4 squared. Okay, and then I can factor out a negative from the numerator. This is going to be helpful. Then I have x squared plus 4 over x squared minus 4 squared. Okay, let's find our critical values. Critical values come from two places where the derivative equals zero, which would mean that the numerator equals zero, which would mean x squared plus four is zero. There are no real solutions to that equation. So I have no critical values from the numerator. Second place where you can get critical values from is where the derivative does not exist. That would mean the denominator equals zero. In this case, that would mean x squared minus four is zero, which would mean x is equal to plus or minus two. However, do you remember when we listed the domain in step one and two and negative two are not part of the domain of the function. So these, since they're not part of the domain, they're not elements of the domain, they're not critical values, okay? You can't have a critical value or a critical point if it's not even allowed to be part of the graph, if the function isn't defined there. So that's why we list the domain in the first step. So you don't just lose all sense of what's going on and accidentally list restrictions as critical values or inflection points or something, okay? In fact, I want you to notice something about the function here, about the derivative actually. The derivative is always negative, right? Since in the denominator, I have x squared minus four squared, that's positive. x squared plus four is always gonna be positive. And then I got this negative sign hanging out right here. So everything will end up being negative, right? When I plug it in to the first derivative. So. That means the function is decreasing everywhere on its domain. So here's what our number line would look like. Okay, here's f prime of x. And anytime there's a, a point removed from the domain, like we know we have vertical asymptotes at negative 2 and 2, you should list them on there. Why? You'll see in just a second. Now we said the derivative's always negative, right? That means the function's decreasing everywhere on its domain. So here's how you would list out intervals of increase and decrease. You would say the function is increasing nowhere and then decreasing, the function is decreasing from negative infinity to negative two, union negative two to two, union 2 to infinity. Do not say it is decreasing everywhere or on all real numbers. That's a big no-no. The function is not defined at negative 2 or 2. Those points are not part of the domain. So it can't even be decreasing there. We can't talk about anything that's going on there. So ha be careful. That's why we list the domain first. And if there are restrictions, put them on that number line so you don't forget about it. Good? Excellent. Are there any local extrema? 
No, right? The graph never changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. So we'll list that in no local extrema. All right, very good. Now let's take another derivative so we can go ahead and look at what's going on with the concavity. So for f prime of x, I factored out that negative in the last step, but I'm going to actually look at the version I had right before that to take the second derivative. So my computation's just a bit easier. Okay, so now it's time to take another derivative, f double prime of x. Here we go. So we've got low d high. Derivative of the numerator is going to be negative 2x minus high d low. Please be careful. We have to use the chain rule. Derivative of x squared minus 4 squared. You bring down the 2. Now you have x squared minus 4 to the first. And then you have to multiply by the derivative of x squared minus 4, which is just 2x over low low. So the denominator squared is going to be x squared minus 4 to the fourth. All right. Now at this point, you have to kind of have some finesse to clean it up so it doesn't turn into just a disaster. Try factoring out the GCF from the numerator. That's going to be very helpful, especially when you take a second derivative of a rational function. You're going to usually have a bunch of stuff you can take out and cancel. Watch this. Watch this. Look at I've got this x squared minus 4. I can take out one of them, can't I? And a 2x. Let's do it. So we're taking out 2x and x squared minus 4. All right. What's left over here? A negative and one of these x squared minus 4s. Okay. A negative and an x squared minus 4. Minus. And then what's going to be left over here? just the 2 and the negative, negative x squared minus 4, right? Let's just distribute that while we're at it. Okay, so we've got x squared plus 4 and a 2 over x squared minus 4 to the 4th. Okay, I'm already feeling better, right? You're not going to have this nightmare of all this foiling and stuff going on in the numerator because check this out. This x squared minus 4 can cancel with one of the ones in the denominator. So now that's just cubed, okay? And then we have here 2x times negative x squared plus 4 plus 2x squared plus 8 over x squared minus 4 cubed. And then we're almost all cleaned up. How exciting. We have 2x, negative x squared and 2x squared. That's positive 1x squared plus a 12 over x squared minus 4 cubed. Love it. There we go. I'm boxing it because, I mean, we should be proud of that. All right. Next step, possible inflection points. I'm going to abbreviate them IPs, okay? So possible inflection points come from two places, just like critical values, where f double prime of x equals 0. So that would mean either 2x is 0, so x is 0, or the other factor, x squared plus 12, is 0. But again, that has no real solution, right? That would mean x squared is negative 12. So all I have right now is x equals 0. Other place you can get inflection points is where f double prime of x does not exist. That would mean the denominator is 0. So that would mean x squared minus 4 is 0, which would mean x is equal to plus or minus 2. But wait a minute, wait a minute. 2 and negative 2 are not elements of, or they do not belong to the domain. So these are not going to be possible inflection points. Okay. I will list them on my number line, right? So I remember to skip over them when I'm giving my intervals of concavity, but they're not going to be inflection points. No, no, no. Okay, but 0, we're good with 0, right? 
This is gonna be a little more exciting then. So here we go, we're gonna test, always label your number line. This is F double prime of X. Students go, where did I plug in to test? You plug it into what you labeled it. So this is F double prime. That's where these possible inflection points are coming from. So here's zero. And then remember, vertical asymptote at negative two and two. Okay. All right, so let's test first interval over here. So for values smaller than negative two, say negative three, that would be negative. I'm not even going to look at the x squared plus 12 because it's always going to be positive. So I'm not even going to waste a second thinking about it. And then in the denominator, say negative 3 squared minus 4, that's positive. So I have a negative over a positive. So the second derivative is negative in this interval, which means the graph is concave down. Okay, next interval, say I plug in negative 1. The numerator is going to be negative. Denominator is negative which makes the second derivative positive. That means the graph is what? Good, concave up. If I plug in, say, positive 1, 2x is going to be positive. Numerator is positive. Denominator is going to be negative because 1 squared minus 4 is negative. So negative, concave down. And then something bigger than 2, like a million, is positive in the numerator, positive in the denominator, concave up. Okay, so let's list our intervals of concavity. Concave up, just abbreviate that, come on. Negative two to zero, union, two to infinity. Oops. Okay, concave down from negative infinity to negative two, union, zero to two. See, even though negative two and two are not part of the domain, right, so they can't be inflection points, it's important to list them on your number line for the second derivative when you're testing intervals of concavity because it can switch on either side of those vertical asymptotes. All right, any inflection points? We only have one, one inflection point at zero. So I'm just gonna write f of zero equals zero. But wait a minute, why aren't negative two and two inflection points? Can you answer that? They're not part of the domain. Those are where my vertical asymptotes are, okay? Good, so now it's time to put the graph together. A lot of the time students get scared to do this part, but you just gotta go for it and trust that you have enough info to do this, okay? We wouldn't lead you astray. You just did seven steps of math, you're ready. Put the asymptotes on there first and your intercepts, okay? Here's my x-axis, y-axis. Asymptotes were at two and negative two. So here's two, negative two, three, four, five. I'm just going for it, okay? Um, y values, we didn't really, I mean, we have zero, zero, that's all. So I'm just gonna leave it like this and Make sure you use a dashed line for those vertical asymptotes. We also had a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero, which is the x-axis. What I like to do to remind myself, because you're not going to see a dashed line on top of it, I just add a little extra off to the side here. So my brain remembers that's where my horizontal asymptote is. Okay? Good. And then no local mins or maxes. I just had the one X and Y intercept, which is also an inflection point. Fancy that. Okay, so here's kind of how I get going. I actually look at the concavity first. So I go, okay, the graph is concave down from negative infinity to negative two. So concave down looks something like this, yeah? And the graph is always decreasing. So think to yourself, which part of this graph is decreasing? Not this part, this is increasing. So right here, after I pass that peak, now the graph is decreasing. So the shape of my function from negative infinity to negative two should look something like this. So you should be able to already kind of have a feel for what it's gonna look like. Concave down, always decreasing, it's gonna look like this, yeah? Okay. That's good enough. You don't have to plot extra points to know exactly like where this is or anything like that. 
Um, in the middle, let's see what's going on. So from negative 2 to 0, now the graph is concave up. So what do concave up graphs look like? Like this. It's decreasing now. So the decreasing portion is right here. All right, so it's decreasing concave up. And then we have an inflection point, so now it's going to switch concavity, so now it's concave down the rest of the way. It looks like negative x cubed, right? Like he got smashed between those two vertical asymptotes. Poor negative x cubed. And then from 2 to positive infinity, it's concave up still, and it's decreasing. So again, it's going to look like this piece here, but remember we have that horizontal asymptote. And don't cross the x or y axis Again, because we found the one and only intercept at 0, 0. So you can't just go willy-nilly crossing the axes in other places, okay? That's it. How was that one? You feel ready to conquer the world of graphing? Okay, I got a couple more examples for you. I promised we would do one with a hole and then one with an oblique asymptote, I think, last, Okay. So let's do the graph with the whole next. All right, example two. The function is as follows. x squared plus x minus 42 over x squared minus x minus 56. Okay. So we need to state the domain first. What I want you to do is factor completely, factor the function completely. So let's start off by factoring the denominator. That's going to be x minus 8 times x plus 7. And so I can tell right off the bat I have two restrictions, x such that x cannot equal 8 or negative 7. Now I do also want you to factor the numerator. Did you do it already? Good, good, good. So it's going to factor into x plus 7 times x minus 6. Okay, so I right away can tell we can reduce this function by canceling out the x plus 7. And then I'm left with x minus 6 over x minus 8. Now this is an important step that you understand what, what's going on. Negative 7, x equals negative 7, is not part of the domain. If you look at the original function, right, plugging in negative 7 would make the denominator 0. So it's not in the domain. However, since I could cancel out that factor, it's called a removable discontinuity. Do you remember hearing that term back when we studied continuity? What that means is the limit of the function exists as a finite number, as we approach negative 7, it's just the graph is not defined there. So we have a hole in the graph. So we have a hole at x equals negative 7. Not a vertical asymptote. I just think to myself, like, it's been demoted because you can cancel it out. So the only one, we're going to have a vertical asymptote at x equals 8, that's it, and then a hole at negative 7. So how do you find exactly where to graph the hole, what the y-coordinate is? Well, in pre-calc, I just tell my students, plug in negative 7 for x into the simplified version of the function. The reason is because according to continuity, you're able to find the limit as x approaches negative 7 of f of x. And you remember doing this back in ooh, the beginning of the, of the semester when you first were taking limits. And you had the limit, x goes to negative 7. You had x squared plus x minus 42 over x squared minus x minus 56. Then you factored and you canceled, right, because you couldn't plug it in here. You would have 0 over 0. So you have limit, x goes to negative 7. I'm just going to cancel already. And then you could go ahead and use direct substitution plug it in. In the numerator, you have negative 13. In the denominator, negative 15. So this is 13 over 15. So that is the y-coordinate of the whole. So probably in pre-calc, all they told you was, you just take this, negative 7, plug it in here, boom, there's the y-coordinate. Because that's equivalent to taking the limit of the function as x approaches negative 7. 
So on our graph, we're gonna plot an open circle at negative seven, 13 over 15, okay? I'm just gonna box that and take care of it now so we don't forget later on when it's time to graph, okay? Very good. Now the cool thing is, for the rest of the computations, you can actually use the simplified version of the function. You don't need to use the original for the derivative, for the intercepts, for anything else, okay? Only when you're considering the domain initially and then we can just, boop, use the easier version, okay? Good, so I'm just gonna focus now on x minus six over x minus eight. All right, let's go ahead and get our intercepts. So x-intercept would come from where the numerator is equal to zero, where the reduced function equals zero, so that would be at six, zero. Y-intercept comes from plugging in zero for x, so zero comma, it would be negative six over negative eight, which is three over four. And if you don't like using the simplified version, you still don't trust me, just go ahead, check it in the original. It's all gonna come out the same. It's just easier when you work with the simplified. Good. Okay, symmetry, whatever. Let's move on to the asymptotes. So vertical asymptote, I do have one, not two though, right? Vertical asymptote is at x equals positive eight the only remaining zero of the denominator after reducing. Horizontal asymptote. Now you can use the original or you can use the simplified. Let's use the simplified. I'm gonna look at the limit as x goes to infinity of x minus six over x minus eight dividing by the highest power of x in the denominator. So I'm gonna multiply by one over x, one over x. This is now the limit as x goes to infinity. If I distribute one over x in the numerator, that's one minus six over x, one minus eight over x, six over x and eight over x go to zero as x goes to infinity and this limit is just one, okay? And nothing would change if we went to negative infinity. So I'll just say, yeah, we took care of both of them, right? Six over x and eight over x would still go to zero, plus or minus zero is the same. So horizontal asymptote is at y equals one. Very good. All right, now let's go ahead, take our first derivative so we can see if we have any critical values where it's increasing, decreasing. Again, you can go ahead and use y equals x minus six over x minus eight instead of the original. It will make life so much better. So the derivative y prime is gonna be x minus eight times one minus high d low over low low. See what a nice little computation it turned out to be. Nothing, nothing too much for you to handle. x minus eight minus x plus six over x minus eight squared. The x's cancel in the numerator. So I just have negative two over x minus eight squared. Notice this is always negative, right? Because x minus eight squared in the denominator is positive and then you just have a negative constant in the top. So let's see, do we have any critical values? So does the derivative ever equal zero? Nope, there's just a constant in the top, that's not happening y prime does not exist, that would mean x equals eight. But remember, that's not part of the domain. So here's our number line. f prime, y prime. I'm calling it y prime because it's not the original f of x and I don't feel right calling it f still. Do you know what I mean? Okay. We have 
restrictions at negative seven, we've got a hole in the graph, and I have a vertical asymptote at eight. But otherwise, the derivative's always negative, the first derivative. So the graph is decreasing everywhere on its domain. Yeah? Okay, so increasing nowhere. Decreasing. Please write this out correctly. Take a second, think about it. Yeah, we have to use three intervals, don't we? So we're going to go from negative infinity to negative 7 union, negative 7 to 8 union, 8 to infinity. Mm -hmm. Any extrema? Nope. So no extrema. No local mins or maxes. So that's done. Interesting, interesting. Okay, how are we doing? Now let's move on to the second derivative. So I'm going to look here. This was my first derivative, negative 2 over x minus 8 squared. And I'm going to rewrite that as negative 2 times x minus 8 to the negative third. That way I can just use the chain rule to get a second derivative, right? So bring the exponent down in the front. That's going to be positive 6 times x minus 8. Why did I write it to the negative third? It was to the negative second. I'm too excited, right? I'm already taking derivatives. It was squared. So sorry. Okay. I got ahead of myself. This is positive 4 times x minus 8 to the negative third now which I can rewrite as 4 over x minus 8 cubed. Okay. Do I have any possible inflection points? So the first place would be where y double prime is 0. Notice I just have a constant in the numerator, so that's not happening. Second place is where y double prime does not exist. Again, that would be at x equals 8, but that's not part of the domain. So nope, that ain't going to be an inflection point. Let's make a number line, test our intervals of concavity. And yeah, we got to skip over, you know, everywhere that's not in the domain. So on my number line, here's negative 7 with the hole, and here's 8 where we have a vertical asymptote. Okay, so smaller than negative 7, like negative 10. Negative 10 minus 8 is negative, and then if you cube it, it's still negative. So the graph is concave down there. Between negative 7 and 8, I mean, aren't we going to test with 0? Who wouldn't? 0 minus 8 cubed, that's negative. So concave down. And then bigger than 8, 10, the denominator is going to be positive. Okay? So let's list our intervals of concavity, concave down from negative infinity to negative 7, union negative 7 to 8, concave up from 8 to infinity. Are there any inflection points? No, there are not. I know there was a change in concavity at x equals 8, but remember... We have a vertical asymptote there. It's not a point on the graph. It's not part of the domain. So it can't be an inflection point. No point exists there. Are you ready to graph? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Let me just make a list of everything that we have. So we have our um, intercepts, right? X-intercept was at 6, 0. Y-intercept was at 0, 3 fourths, and we have the hole in the graph at negative 7, 13 over 15. So just a smidge less than 1. I mean, I'm not going to come measure, okay? Good. So I would say for your x-axis, you know, go maybe like negative 8 to 8, and then the y-axis, you just need to go up a little bit. Nothing too wild. I went up to 4 when I did this last time. So here's the y-axis. You don't have to scale them the same, you know. It's your graph. It's your world. So as long as you just label things and people know what you're doing, 
do what makes sense to make a nice clear graph. I'm going to scale by two. So here's two, four, six, eight. Actually, no, I want to scoot them a little closer. Two, four, six, eight, there. So you can see kind of what's going on on the other side. Negative two, negative four, negative six, negative eight. And the hole is going to be like right in the middle there. And then here's one, two, three, four, negative one, two, three, four. And then we have, let me list again, vertical asymptote at x equals eight. And then horizontal asymptote was at y equals one, right? Good. Okay, put those in first. Let's do light blue today. So vertical x equals eight. That's going to be right here. And then horizontal y equals one. Ooh, so nice. Okay, x intercept at six, zero. Y intercept at zero, three fourths. Okay, hole at negative seven, 13 over 15. So just a smidge below one, here's the hole. Ooh, okay, the graph is concave down from negative infinity to negative seven, union negative seven to eight. So it's concave down all in here, okay? Don't worry, I'll erase that disgusting circle. So concave down, and remember, the first derivative was always negative, so it's decreasing. It looks like this. Can you figure out what it's going to look like? It's just living right here, minding its own business. And then someone came and plucked a little hole out of the graph. Okay, good. And then on the other side of the vertical asymptote, the graph is concave up. There's no intercept, so it's just floating in here. Also minding its business. Good? See, it's not so bad when there's a hole in the graph. You just gotta think about it really carefully in the beginning and then afterwards, it actually makes the computation easier than that first example we did, I think, I think. Okay, last one, I promised you an oblique asymptote, okay? How do you know when you have an oblique asymptote? In pre-calc, you should have covered this. It's when the degree of the numerator is exactly one higher than the degree of the denominator. If you are frightened, I'll link right now the pre-calc video that I have. That just goes through the basics, but you're not taking derivatives and stuff in it. It's just kind of laying the foundation, okay? So here we have f of x equals x squared minus 3x minus 4 over x minus 5. So right off the bat, I can tell I'm going to have an oblique asymptote because the numerator is degree 2 and the denominator is degree 1. If the numerator was degree 10 and the denominator was degree 9, again, you would have an oblique asymptote if the difference is but 1 higher in the numerator, okay? All right, so let's go ahead, see if it factors more. Now that you're on the lookout for a hole, maybe you're thinking, oh my goodness, they're popping up left and right. Not in this case, because this numerator factors, it's x minus four, x plus one, and then the denominator is x minus five. So nothing's gonna cancel. We don't have a hole in the graph. Uh, domain x such that x doesn't equal five, okay? Um, x intercept, is where the function is zero. Just look at the numerator. Oh, we got two of them. This is exciting. So we have four, zero, negative one, zero. Y intercept comes from plugging in zero for X. I usually, I look back at the original because it's easier, right? Just to imagine all the X is gone. Yeah, so you have zero, negative four fifths, which is just zero, four fifths. Vertical asymptote, yes, we have one at x equals five. Okay, and then we need to find the equation of our oblique asymptote. How do you do that? You long divide. If you forgot how to long divide, I have the video. I'll link it here. It's short, just watch it. You'll get it in two seconds. You can't do synthetic. I'm so sorry for the equation of the oblique. Sometimes it will work, but it will not give you the correct equation if the denominator is of a different form. So just don't do it. Always long divide for oblique asymptote. 
we have x minus 5 divided into x squared minus 3x minus 4. Okay, so x into x squared, that's going to be x. Then you multiply. This is x squared minus 5x. Then subtract. These should cancel. Now I have 2x. Bring down the negative 4. And then repeat the process. So just divide x into 2x. It's plus 2. And then multiply 2x minus 10. Subtract. And the remainder is 6. You don't include the remainder because now that we're in calculus, we understand why. The oblique asymptote gives you the end behavior of the graph, right? What it approaches as x goes to infinity. And as x goes to infinity, we can tell that 6 over x minus 5, that remainder is going to go to 0. So that's why I don't know if you remember from pre-calc, your teacher probably telling you, you don't need to include the remainder when you're finding the equation of the oblique asymptote. Bam, now you know why, okay? So here's the equation of the oblique asymptote. I'll list it over here. It's at y equals x plus 2. So you're just going to draw a dashed line, right, with slope of 1, y-intercept 2. Don't overthink the oblique asymptotes. It's not a big deal. You've graphed lines since the beginning algebra, so now it's just a dashed one. That's all. Nothing too wild. Okay, derivative time. So we have f of x equals x squared minus 3x minus 4 over x minus 5. So f prime of x. I say you pause the video, try this on your own, make sure you can do the quotient rule smoothly at this point. It shouldn't be tricky for you anymore, okay? Pause it and then check that you got the same thing as me. Okay, good. Did you pause it? I hope you did. So we've got low d high minus high d low is 1 over low low x minus 5 squared. Then you clean it up. You do have to foil. Nothing factors out, huh? Did you try 2x squared minus 3x minus 10x plus 15 minus x squared plus 3x plus 4 over x minus 5 squared. And then we're left with x squared minus 10x plus 19 over x minus 5 squared. Bam, that's f prime. Did you get it right? If not, check y. Understand where you messed up so you don't do it again, okay? Now let's get our critical values. They come from two places where f prime of x equals 0. That would mean x squared minus 10x plus 19 is 0. Hmm, that does not factor. Oh me, oh my, what to do? Yes, it's quadratic formula time. So x is equal to opposite of b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Okay, this is going to simplify to 10 plus or minus square root 100 minus 4 times 19, that's going to be 40 plus 36. So we're going to be left with rad 24 over 2. Okay, that can simplify, can't it? Yes, rad 24 is 2 rad 6. So this is 5 plus or minus rad 6. Okay. You want to know what those are as decimals because we're going to test them on the number line. So just keep in mind it's about 7.4 and 2.6. When you report your answer, though, give the exact. All right. The decimal is just for us when we graph and on the number line. 
All right, next is where f double prime of x does not exist. Oh, not f double yet, just f. So where does f prime not exist when the denominator is zero? That would mean x equals five. But remember, that's not part of the domain. So that is not a critical value. Okay, so we actually are gonna list five on the number line, but then we're not going to include it, right, as a possible critical value. Okay, here we go, number line time. F prime of x. So we have vertical asymptote at five. And then we have a critical value at five plus rad six, which remember is 7.4 ish. And then five minus rad six, which is about 2.6. Okay, and then I will save you time. I already tested, so it's positive here, increasing. Negative here, decreasing. Negative here decreasing, positive here, increasing. So let's list our intervals of increase and decrease. Increasing from negative infinity to five minus rad six, union five plus rad six to infinity, and decreasing from five minus rad six, oops, to where? To five, union five to five plus rad six. Okay? Good, local extrema, local max at x equals five minus rad six. Oh, I don't wanna plug that in the original, that's so mean, I won't make you. So if you're in my class, you can just find the decimal value of the y-coordinate. So that would be 2.6, about 2.1. Local min, where's that? At x equals 5 minus or plus rad 6 at, at. And again, let's just plug it in. I did it with the calculator, 11.9. Okay. Good. Now it's time to box that and take our second derivative. Here we go. Second derivative. The first derivative, let me remind you. F prime of x was x squared minus 10x plus 19 over x minus five squared. F double prime. F double prime time. So we have low, d high is going to be 2x minus 10 minus high, d low, chain rule, be careful, 2 times x minus 5 to the first times 1. Okay. Oh, that looks so bad. Over low, low. So x minus 5 to the fourth. You remember last time for the second derivative how we factored out the GCF and it was just a game changer? Let's do it again. So I can take out two and x minus five, which is two x minus 10, do you see that? And I think that's all we can take out. So let's go for it. Two times x minus five. And then here I will have this x minus five squared left over. minus this second term here. Okay, I'm gonna distribute the negative. x squared plus 10x minus 19 over x minus five to the fourth. And then much like that last problem, this x minus five can cancel out with one of the x minus fives down here. Good, just leave the two though, so we have two times x minus 5 squared, that's x squared minus 10x plus 25 minus x squared plus 10x. Ooh, this is going to clean up so nicely. 
Are you getting excited over x minus 5 cubed? Okay, cancel, 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 cancel. Wow, that was fun. And then 25 minus 19, that's 6, times 2 is 12. Hmm. I mean, no one's asking you for the third derivative, but couldn't you do it with such ease? Just write that as 12 times x minus 5 to the negative third, and bam. Okay, now let's find our possible inflection points. Possible IPs. So remember, they come from two places where the second derivative equals 0, which is not going to happen. I have a constant up there. And then where f double prime does not exist, that would be where the denominator is 0, x equals 5, but that's not in the domain. So that's it. I will put it on the number line. Let's test our concavity. So here's f double prime. Here's the asymptote at 5. Say I plug in 4 for x. The denominator is going to be negative. So my graph is concave down. And then if I plug in something bigger than 5, like 6, it's positive, so concave up. So concave down from negative infinity to 5, concave up from 5 to infinity, and no inflection points because 5 is not part of the domain. Oh my goodness, you guys, we made it. Now we get to just put the graph together. Yay. Okay. I will remind you of all the exciting stuff we found in the beginning of the problem. So we had x-intercept at 4, 0, negative 1, 0. Y-intercept was at 0, 4 fifths. Um, vertical asymptote, x equals 5. Oblique asymptote, y equals x plus 2. And then we had those local extrema, right? Local mins and maxes. So local max, just for graphing purposes, I'm writing the decimal. But when you report your answer, give the exact x value. 2.6, 2.1, local min, 7.4, 11.9. Woo, okay, so I scaled the x-axis by twos and I went up to 20. I was really just vibing out. And then um, the y-axis I scaled by tens the last time I did this. You can kind of just, you might have to adjust when you start putting everything together and you realize you need more, you know. Okay, here we go. X-axis. I hope you like the graphing part of it. It's like the fruits of all your hard work. You spend all this time finding out all this information. You want to put it together nicely, right? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty. And then I went ten, twenty, thirty, forty. Just to show a lot of the shape. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. And then. Local min was at 11.9. Okay. And then we have here 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. 2, 4, 6, 8, 20. Okay. So let's see, x-intercept is at 4, 0, and negative 1, 0. Let's put the asymptotes in first. Vertical asymptote is at x equals 5. So 2, 4, here's 5. And then I have oblique asymptote at y equals x plus 2. Okay, you know what? I don't want this by 10, so it's going to be to spread out. So let's say, let me, let me fix this because I want to be able to see that x-intercept of 2. So let's scale this by 2s also. My apologies, my apologies. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 
12, 14, 16, 18, 20. That's going to be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Okay. I mean, that happens sometimes. Okay, x plus 2. Then I can show you now nicely. Like, the y-intercept is going to be here. And the slope is 1. So you can have, you know, x-intercept also here. And just draw a line, a dashed line, though. You know what? I think I have that option here, don't I? Yes. Check this out. Dashed line. And will it straighten it out for me? Yes. Wow. Beautiful. Cool, huh? Now I don't like the other vertical one so much. Oh, well, it's fine. Next time we'll fix it. Um, good. Now let's put in those intercepts. So x-intercept is at 4, 0. So that would be right here. And then also at negative 1, 0. Let's make this skinnier so you can see. Here's negative 1, 0. And then y-intercept, 0, 4 fifths. Oh, that's right there. And then we have a local max at 2.6, 2.1. So that would be like right there. There's my local max. And the graph is concave down, yes? All the way from negative infinity to 5. So up until the vertical asymptote, it's concave down. So it's looking like a parabola, sort of, smashed here. That's the max right there. And then it's just going to curve back down here. See that? So nice. Okay, I am going to change this so it looks like the other asymptote. That's a new feature. I forgot about that. Okay, so that was at 5, 2, 4, 5, right here. Oh, let's scoot it over just a smidge. Beautiful. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, and then let's see here what else is going on on the graph. I have no information about the other piece other than the local min at 7.4, 11.9. That's cool. 2, 4, 6, 7.4, 11.9, somewhere around here. That's the min, okay? And then it's just concave up, smashed in here. So there's part of the graph. And there's the other part. It shouldn't go away like that. I'm sorry. Hold on. Okay. Hugging those asymptotes. Nice. Nice, nice. I want it the same color. Let's make it all the same color. I'll make the graph lighter. One second. You have to have an aesthetic appreciation for these things. Okay. There we go. Good. Oh, now I'm happy with it. Now I'm happy with it. Print it and put it on the refrigerator. This is a thing of beauty. Okay. I hope you guys found it helpful. Again, graphing is just something that takes patience and you have to be meticulous. So don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already. And let me know if you have any other requests for videos. I'm always happy to make them for you guys.